chemotherapy, but we don't make our treatment decisions based on the histology of the tumor, it's on the other characteristics. Um, obviously, as we move forward and we get more information from uh, genetic profiling, we're going to know a lot more about the biology of cancers to tailor our treatment better. So this patient, um, she had to choose between lumpectomy plus radiation or mastectomy. Um, she had to decide whether she was going to have a full node dissection up front or a sentinel node. This is issued, these are information that will be discussed by Dr. Schechter and Dr. Huang later on. But in terms of um, her meeting with me, so the typical pattern is that after a patient goes to surgery, you know, two to three weeks later, sometimes sooner, um, she'll meet with the oncologist um, to discuss the treatment options. And I'm just going to lay it out for her. This is, this is a very typical treatment recommendation for a patient that has a um, HER2 positive, node positive cancer. And I'm going to explain the data about how we got there. So this patient received, was, the recommendations were that she would receive adriamycin and cytoxin, given one dose every two or three weeks for four cycles, followed by paclitaxel weekly given concurrent with trastuzumab, which is Herceptin, for 12 weeks, and then she would continue the trastuzumab weekly for um, either weekly or every three weeks for a total of one year. And then because she's hormone receptor positive, she would receive tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor, depending on what her menopausal status is at the time that she completes chemotherapy, and in this case, radiation therapy. So how do we know? Where did this all start? How do we know that this patient who had a lumpectomy and a, and a no dissection isn't already cured by just the treatment that she received? And this is one of the most common questions that we get um, in medical oncology. They say, well, my surgeon told me that the margins are clear. How is it that I need all this additional therapy? So backing up, um, one of the most useful resources we've had as medical oncologists is this um, collaborative group called the Early Breast Cancer Trials Collaborative Group. And it's basically a, a, a group that does large meta-analysis on data from clinical trials dating back into the 70s. So this process was initiated in 1983. They collected that data on hormonal therapies and chemotherapy starting in 1985. And the most recent publication was actually in Lancet in 2005, um, looking at data that actually um, was collected up through 2001. And so this meta-analysis includes information on over 200,000 women, 400 randomized trials, and 250 trial groups. And so this is a wealth of information. Down here is the um, summary. If anybody's really interested in reading a very dry paper, their papers are some of the most dry you've ever read. Have you ever read through one of these? They're, pa they're painfully dry. And um, so, but just to cut to the chase, that chemotherapy is almost always recommended based on this data. Um, for patients that have no positive disease, particularly in pre- or perimenopausal patients. Now, move, this, is, this is an epidemiologic model where we assume that our patient has characteristics that are very much like all these women who are included in all these trials, but now we have the advantage of using biologically-based assays like the Oncotype DX and the Mammoprint um, that can provide us now both prognostic and predictive information um, to guide treatment. And I had included in my summary that I would talk very briefly about these two um, these two assays, but I see you know Laura Vantveer, who is um, you know one of the founders of Mammoprint, is going to be here speaking to you, and you're going to have other presentations on endocrine therapy and um, uh, down the road. So I thought actually it would be better for me to kind of focus on the treatment today instead of getting bogged down with how we use these assays. So. Before we had Oncotype and Mammoprint, the way that we would advise patients about their risk was to actually plug their information into a model, a program called Adjuvant Online, which was developed by a, a gentleman named Peter Rabdin, who was originally um, at a UT Southwestern, or I mean, sorry, UT San Antonio, and now is at MD Anderson. And he created this model using epidemiologic data and SEER database data. And um, it allows you to um, enter in a patient's tumor size, their hormone receptor status, their comorbidities, so how many major health problems you think they have, their tumor grade, and then it comes up with an estimate of their 10-year risk of recurrence as well as their risk of dying of cancer. And the one thing this model does not include is HER2 at this point because this data was collected you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago where HER2 was not routinely studied on every um, tumor consistently because, again, the adjuvant receptin trials didn't start until you know, the mid to late 90s. So we don't have all that information. So when you're dealing with a HER2 positive patient, the adjuvant online data probably underestimates the risk of recurrence, but it is one of the tools that we use. And so then the adjuvant online model also actually takes into consideration that chemotherapy benefit based on the data from the early breast cancer trialist group seems to be somewhat dependent on a patient's tumor grade and a patient's age. And the tumor grade, um, we now recognize that this is kind of tied into the biological information we get from mammoprint and oncotype, that tumors that are higher grade 
have higher proliferation indexes, perhaps have higher invasion indexes, um, have a greater benefit from chemotherapy. And then obviously with the patient age, as patients age, they develop more, more COVID comorbidities and they have a greater chance of dying of other things. So these um, data suggest that there's actually not very much information to tell us, uh, to guide us about the benefit of chemotherapy in women over the age of 70. But in summary, with the oncotype and mammoprint, um, we know, and there's a recently published uh, paper in uh, breast cancer uh, research and treatment um, confirming this for mammoprint as well as oncotype, that patients who have the oncotype score comes back as a recurrent score, and the mammoprint comes back as a risk signature, either high risk or low risk. People that have either a high recurrent score with the oncotype or a high risk signature with mammoprint um, derive greater benefit from chemotherapy, whereas people who have a low risk mammoprint or a low recurrent score probably derive very little benefit from chemotherapy. So these tests are proving to be very useful. So once you decide that a patient needs to get chemotherapy, then we have a huge number of regimens. And for the sake of time, you know, I can't go through um, all of these, but in short, you know, TC stands for taxotere and cytoxin. AC is adriamycin cytoxin. FAC is 5 few adriamycin cytoxin. And you can see here that, you know, we have some selections that fall only on the node negative side because that's where the data lies. Some selections fall on the node positive side. But there's, uh, you can see that all the, there's a lot of T's, a lot of C's, and a lot of A's and E's. There's not a lot of other number, letters. So you can see there's not that much variability with these regimens. They're all very similar, but with one or two substitutions. So we know that this patient has node positive disease. We have data from the breast cancer trials group that she's going to benefit from chemotherapy. And so what about the fact that she has HER2 positive breast cancer? So I know that there's a lot of pathologists and basic science folks in the room, so everybody knows what HER2 is. It's a protein that's present on the surface of about one quarter of breast cancers, and the receptor is, um, is overexpressed and uh, due to amplification of the gene, um, the HER2 gene. And uh, there was an antibody, trastuzumab or Perceptin, that was developed specifically to target the HER2 protein. It's a humanized antibody, and it's been approved for metastatic breast cancer since 1998 and approved for adjuvant breast cancer since about 2006. And we have a tremendous amount of um, uh, information about the usefulness of this drug. Um, there are a lot of mechanisms of action that are proposed for uh, trastuzumab for the sake of time. I'm going to skip over this because I know that Dr. Moaster has already given you quite a bit of information about the biology of HER2 positive disease, and I think you're going to get more of that later on. Um, so the background for the adjuvant trastuzumab studies, we know that HER2 amplification is an independent um, negative prognostic factor for metastatic disease and death in breast cancer patients. And we believe, based on the metastatic data, that um, in inhibiting or, or interfering with HER2 signaling um, can uh, improve survival. So the next obvious thing was to study these in early stage breast cancer. So there have been a number of clinical trials in early stage breast cancer. And this is just to show you the trial design of one of these trials, the NSABPD31 trial where patients receive four cycles of AC followed by paclitaxel, or they receive four cycles of AC followed by weekly paclitaxel with trastuzumab, and the heart reflects the cardiac monitoring they have because trastuzumab um, is known to potentially cause some cardiac toxicity, as is adriamycin, and this was a, pa a trial for patients that have no positive disease that were HER2 positive. A trial that had a similar design is a trial we participated in here at UCSF, the NSABP, or the um, intergroup 9831 trial, and the trial design was quite similar, except in this trial they actually looked at the sequencing of trastuzumab. Was it more advantageous to combine the trastuzumab with at least part of the chemotherapy, or did it matter if it was sequenced after? And because these trials had such a similar design, they actually uh, did a joint combined analysis, and you can see here that patients who received trastuzumab had a significantly um, improved disease-free survival on top. 85% compared to 67% with a median fall of about two, up to two years. Now this data has been uh, now is now updated beyond five years, but this was the publication in the New England Journal. The um, benefits from adding trastuzumab to chemotherapy have have held, and the over there was also an overall survival benefit demonstrated early on with the addition of trastuzumab to chemotherapy. So based on this data, um, trastuzumab did uh, gain approval in the adjuvant setting. Um, there, as you can see here, addition of trastuzumab reduced um, distant disease, or improved distant disease-free survival by 53% and improved overall survival by 33%. One of the, the issues, though, with trastuzumab is it can cause cardiac toxicity. So there was um, investigators that were interested in seeing if you could actually eliminate um, an anthracycline 
from a trastuzumab containing regimen, and that led to the BCIRG study, which compared an anthracycline containing regimen 